A, alert 911. B, bleeding. C is for compress. Before we jump into Stop the Bleed, I want to remind you to subscribe to our channel so you're alerted of future videos. Like this video if you find it helpful, and then leave us a comment in the comments below if you have any questions or feedback for us. So this is a quick overview of a Stop the Bleed course or a bleeding control course. We go into more detail on some of these things and some of our other videos, so be sure to check out those other videos. But right now, this is an abbreviated overview for Stop the Bleed. So why do we need this? Well, the number one cause of preventable death after an injury is bleeding. So if we can tell people how to stop the bleeding, then we have a much greater chance of survival for some of these victims. And a bystander is gonna be the best person to be able to control direct bleeding until emergency officials can arrive on scene. These techniques apply whether you are in the rural setting, hiking, camping, fishing, or you're in the mall shopping and something happens, whether it's a car wreck or an active shooter or just hanging out with some friends and someone gets hurt. Bleeding control techniques can save lives. So this stop the bleed is as easy as one, two. One, identify that it's severe bleeding, and two, stop the bleeding with either tourniquets, packing, or pressure. But let's hold up for just a minute. You have to make sure that you're safe before you can render aid to someone else. If something happens to you, you can no longer effectively help them. So if you're on the side of a highway, make sure that you are in a safe spot and you're not gonna get hit by other traffic before you render aid to this person. If you're in an active shooter situation, make sure that you are shielded and that if possible, you can take that victim and pull them to a safe place so that they're shielded as well. So the first thing is to make sure the area is safe and then you can begin bleeding control techniques. Another aspect of safety is keeping yourself from bloodborne pathogens. So there are a lot of diseases that can be transmitted via blood and bodily fluids. So if you can wear gloves, that's always preferred. Your skin is a great barrier, but if you're using just your skin, just know that any cuts or scrapes on your hand is now an opening that invites bacteria, uh, bloodborne illnesses and diseases now into your body. Likewise, if you have dirty hands and you're wound packing, you can take that dirt and bacteria and transfer it into that person, which can cause further infection. So gloves are always a good idea if you have them available to you. So a quick memory aid to help us here is ABC. Alert 911, bleeding, look for the bleeding, and then compress. We're gonna use pressure to stop the bleeding in these areas. A, alert 911. When you call 911, they're gonna to wanna to know exactly where you are. So if you are at a mall or a large warehouse or shopping center, make sure that you can pinpoint a um, area or a store or some landmark that allows them to be able to come right to you. It makes it a lot easier for the first responders when they're trying to get to you. But go ahead and activate that 911 early so that they can be responding and then you can be working while the emergency officials are responding to you. You're also gonna to wanna to make sure you give a patient count. If it's just an individual, individual that is injured, no big deal. Um, they'll send one ambulance and cruise out to you. But if there are multiples that are injured um, in a car wreck or a mass casualty incident, make sure you include the number to the best of your ability so they know what resources to start rolling your way. B, bleeding. So when we're looking for bleeding, we're not really worried about cuts and scrapes right now. We're looking for severe bleeding. Severe bleeding is something that's continuous, large amounts of blood, and when we start to see pooling of blood or uh, pools or piles of blood underneath that injury, that's an indicator that we have severe bleeding that needs to be treated. Keep in mind there may be multiple places where this victim is bleeding. So just because you find one place and you treated that one place doesn't mean there's not a secondary injury. So make sure after you treat one that you look really well and that you try to find if there are any additional wounds that you need to be aware of. Keep in mind that clothes can also hide severe bleeding. You may have uh, bleeding on the backside of a patient that's laying on the ground and you may not be able to readily see that until you roll them over or move them. So make sure you do a thorough assessment to make sure that you have not missed any injuries. So there are three main places that we're looking for bleeding. The first are the extremities, arms and legs. The second are junctional areas. That is where an extremity comes into the core. So the groin, the buttocks, the armpits, uh, shoulder area, and even the neck where the head comes in. So these are junctional areas. The third area is the core. So if we have bleeding on chest, abdomen, or back, that would be our third area. C is for compress. This is where we want to put pressure on that bleeding to stop the bleeding. Blood travels through arteries and arteries are now 
um, severed and allow that blood to leak out. So we want to put pressure to occlude that artery to stop that blood and keep the blood inside the body. So the first thing we wanna do when we see that severe bleeding, that constant bleeding that is now pooling large amounts of blood, we wanna put pressure on this area. Immediate direct pressure with your hand, gloves are nice in this situation, but we want immediate pressure you have some gauze or a shirt or something with you, some cloth that you can put on top of there, we can use that as well. Uh, but we need to put direct pressure on that wound first thing, even before we go into other measures like tourniquet um, or something else. This buys us time and slows the bleeding while we can actually take further steps to stop this bleeding. If you have severe bleeding on an extremity, and you have a commercial tourniquet available to you, go ahead and apply the tourniquet. If you don't have a tourniquet and there's not a stop the bleed kit somewhere around you that you can pull a tourniquet from, skip to the next section and there's some other things we can do. Um, but for now, we're talking specifically about tourniquets. So if it's on an extremity, arms or legs, and you have a tourniquet, go ahead and place that tourniquet two to three inches above the wound, tighten it down until the bleeding stops, lock it into place, and leave that tourniquet on there. A couple notes on tourniquets. If one tourniquet does not stop the bleeding, there may be a time where you have to place a second tourniquet next to it. Most likely, if you're placing this on a thigh, that will be the case, is that you'll have to use two tourniquets to get enough pressure to occlude that artery. If you're doing it on an arm or a smaller person, you may be able to do that with one tourniquet, but if need be, apply a second tourniquet. The tourniquets can go over close, Note that tourniquets will hurt. So just because the person says, hey, this hurts, doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. You still need to put that tourniquet on and get that compression to be able to stop the bleeding. You may be doing this to yourself or someone else. So you can do self-aid with these tourniquets. That's all we're gonna say about tourniquets in this video. We just wanted to touch on them to uh, give you an overview, but we have a lot more instructional videos and information about tourniquets in some of our other videos. So definitely go check those out so you get more comfortable with some of these tourniquets. Another type of compression that we can use to stop severe arterial bleeding is wound packing. If you put direct pressure on an area of bleeding and that stops the bleeding, and then you can put a pressure bandage on top of that and it stops the bleeding, you have just met your objective. No need to go any further or get too complicated. Just keep that pressure on there and wait for an ambulance or someone to get there to take that from you. If you don't have a tourniquet with you, or if it's in an area where you can't put a tourniquet, and we're gonna call those junctional areas. So where an extremity comes into your core, you're not gonna be able to get a tourniquet high enough to cover these areas to be able to get two to three inches above that wound. So you're gonna to have to wound pack. So in the void or in the hole that this wound has created, we're gonna take some gauze. Hopefully it's sterile clean gauze. If you don't have that, you can use a t-shirt. Just know that all the dirt and grime from that t-shirt is getting packed in that wound and that just is inviting more infection for that patient. So we wanna to try to pack this with some clean things, preferably some sterile gauze. Um, so if you have that available to you, definitely use that. This is also the time where you would use quick clot or Celox or some other um, hemostatic agent if you have that available. So we're gonna pack this in the wound. We're gonna find the area of bleeding. We're gonna start packing. We're gonna fill that entire wound with this wound packing gauze or this quick clot. We wanna completely fill this wound and then we almost want a bunch of extra gauze heaped up on top of it. Then we're gonna put pressure on that, hold steady pressure. And if we have a pressure bandage, this is the time where we'll take the pressure bandage and tightly wrap it around to hold our uh, gauze in place in that wound. A couple special notes for children. Children can still have tourniquets applied to them um, if they have severe bleeding. Most tourniquets will go down fairly small in size. If you find a child that is, uh, has an extremity too small to where when you try to put the tourniquet on, you actually can't get it tight enough. Most of the time, these children are so small that you can put direct pressure and you can actually occlude that artery very easily with direct pressure. So if you find that the tourniquet is not working because the child is too small, typically direct pressure on that area should be efficient enough to be able to stop that bleeding. As far as wound packing in children, it should be no different than adults. You're gonna follow the same procedures, pack the entire wound, put a pressure dressing on top of it, and uh, use that pressure to stop the bleeding. So if you have bleeding in the core, unfortunately, this is a non-compressible area. We cannot push on things or pack a wound to be able to stop that bleeding. This is a hollow area full of organs and um, your heart, lungs, all your intestines. And if we start wound packing, it's like dropping quarters in a piggy bank. You're just gonna continue to wound pack and just start 
distending the abdomen or something. Something's going to give and move. You're not going to be able to compress that bleeding. So unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do for bleeding in the chest area. And that's unfortunate. There's some people um, working on advanced procedures to try to make this better for paramedics and the military, but there's just not a lot we can do other than surgery for severe bleeding in this area. One thing you can do for penetrating trauma in the chest area, such as a gunshot wound, impalement in a car wreck, or something like that, is to put a chest seal or an occlusive dressing on that area. This is not for stopping bleeding, but this is potentially helping this patient to be able to breathe better. There is a sealed area around your lungs that has a vacuum on it, so to speak, and it helps hold your lungs open. When you have damage to the chest wall that breaks that seal, the lung will collapse and the only way to help remedy this is to make sure that there is not air passing through that area. We want air to escape uh, that's trapped in the chest to be able to come out, but we don't want any of the air from the outside to be able to go in and further collapse that lung. So this is where a chest seal or a occlusive dressing comes in hand. If you have a gloved hand or some sort of plastic, you can place that over that area to keep that air from actually coming and entering the chest. You do have to watch though, because it could develop into a further collapsed lung and there could be pressure inside the chest that wants to get out. So the best thing to use for these are vented chest seals. They're commercial dressings. Um, they have vents in them. You place them, it allows air to go out, but not to get back in. This is the simplest, easiest way to deal with penetrating trauma to the chest. So a quick overview for this Stop the Bleed course. ABCs, alert 911, identify the bleeding, and then compress that bleeding. For compression, we are gonna be using direct pressure immediately. Then we're gonna figure out if we need a tourniquet or wound packing. And then the last little bonus for this video is also chest seals for penetrating trauma from the neck to the navel. Anywhere in there, slap an occlusive dressing or chest seal on there. So this was a really rapid, quick overview for Stop the Bleed. We didn't go into much detail on how to use tourniquets, so make sure you check out our other videos that walk you through tourniquets, wound packing, chest seals, all that stuff in further detail. This is just an overview. This is also the same curriculum that is pushed out there for um, schools, teachers, churches, uh, laypersons, civilians. So this is just a real broad overview. This does not get very specific for people in EMS, military. If you're someone that carries a gun, you may want to at least start here and then uh, go into further bleeding control and further classes. This is just a real broad, quick place to start for bleeding control. Share this with other people that may need it. This is something, a uh, skill that anybody could use. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.